Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon and we are picking up in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 9. We'll start again verse by verse, phrase by phrase in verse 5. Just as a quick, quick review, we've come through the, the time of the flood. We actually got Noah off the ark and all the animals that went on with him and all the people that went on with him. There was no death in the ark. Everything, the life that went into the ark came out alive. And God kept them completely and safely and brought them through. And we're starting to look at the fact that God is now setting down new laws for them to live by. Some the same, but some very different. We looked last time, and I will not go into it in its entirety, but we looked at the fact that they were now going to eat um, from the animal life, but they were not to eat the blood from it. When something's kosher, the blood has been drained out of that, and it's been replaced with spices and seasonings and things to give it its flavor. But the blood was to be looked upon as something precious, something valuable because it is life. We saw last week that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And we saw in scripture that we see that blood is a sign of mercy. It's a sign of God's covenant. It's what sanctifies us. It's what set aside the priests for their holy work to and to God representing the people to God. It made atonement for the people, uh, justifies us, seals us, redeems us, brings us shalom with God, cleanses us even gives us entrance into God's holy place in heaven forever. It allows fellowship with God in the meantime, and it even enables us to overcome Satan, our enemy. That's just in a nutshell what we saw with the blood. We are so thankful for the, the blood and what it does represent. And so Noah is not being taught uh, something mystic, but he's being taught the preciousness of the blood and what it means. That's why when the Lord gave his blood for us, it was precious and it was vital for life. There's uh, also a requirement that's going to come if there is the taking of blood. And this is the instituting of capital punishment. And even when we change from the time of human government, we're going to see God never takes that off the plate, that that is something that was instilled continuing on. Capital punishment now is being instituted with human government. We're going to go into a time period of human government, human ruling, making those rules. Until now, man was avenged by God himself. Cain, Cain, when he committed murder, God sealed him, put a mark on him so that no one would take his life. We're going to see a change now where someone takes life and their life is to be taken. If you want Cain, it, when it was like that for him, that was all the way back in chapter 4 and verse 15. But now we're going to see that there is a requirement. <clears throat> and we'll understand why as we go along if you don't already understand. Verse 5 says, surely I will require your lifeblood from every beast I will require. And I guess really we need to back up to get that full thought. Let me go back to verse three. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. Okay, now you can eat the green, the herbs and all that, but you also can eat um, the things that move, the flesh. Only, uh, yeah, only you shall not eat flesh with this blood that is its blood. Surely I'll require your lifeblood. From every beast I will require it, and from every man, from, and from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of a man. Require. He, God's going to demand this. That's a judicial term in our Hebrew. And God is appearing as the judge with the people now. He's exacting a very strict payment for the breaking of his law. So we've had a time of innocence in the garden, conscience right after the garden time, we continued on and now we're moving into human government and God is allowing the humans to take a role in this, but he's, he's going to be very strict about it. There is going to be consequences to the actions of breaking these laws. This is the first time that the sword of magisterial authority is being committed to the hands of man. The idea behind it is to suppress crime. 
There has to be punishment of evildoers or crime will run rampant. I don't think I need to try to pull an example out for you. I think we all know we're living in that. Everywhere we see where they let down on the laws against crime, what happens? Crime rises. It doesn't keep it down. And the idea behind the laws was to suppress to hold back that evil. We'll be saying more as we go along, so I'll, I'll leave it for that at the moment, and we'll look at the end of that phrase, uh, the end of that verse where it says, and from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Now, the idea is not revenge. It's not that we, oh, okay, now we can go an eye for an eye, a tooth for tooth, we can revenge and, and this is good but it's that all men were to be responsible to see to it that justice was executed. And at this time, by the way, when it uses the phrase every man's brother, well, who do we have? Everybody was brothers. <laughs> We've got Noah's three sons. It could be literal at this point, but of course, as it goes out, we know that, that the brothers are the humanity, just the same way that we use the term today, yes. Uh, well, we're at chapter 9 and verse 5. What's it go through? Just verse 6, chapter 9. You don't have... Okay, that's page 26. Maybe I don't have 27 here. Maybe I forgot to send it out. Okay, if we get down there, I'll slow down on the verses, and I will get it to you before you leave. I can get your copy because I have it. I think I apparently did forget. My apologies. Look in your emails. If you don't find page 27 today, look tomorrow. <laughs> I guess hopefully tonight I'll send it. And I do apologize. I didn't even realize I hadn't done it. So, yeah. But uh, we may go through a number of verses before you'll come to where it would have been anyway. Um, but the idea here again is, even though all men were brothers at this point, they're going to continue on. We're in the brotherhood, you know, is the way that we would put it. So, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. Okay, let's look at what that last part means and then go back up to the first part. In the image of God. We have been made in God's image. We know that. that it doesn't mean that we are God, but the God made us in his likeness, and he'll relate to us in that. And the idea here is that it, you need to remember that this person's made in God's image. God is our king. So in essence, it's saying if you kill that person, if you knew the king was sitting right there watching you, that's how you should be acting. Would you be you know, taking this, this action against this fellow brother of yours if you knew that the, the one was sitting right there on the throne, the king was sitting right there on the throne. Um, to deface the king's image was treason. Anyone who came against anything, gave the king a black eye, so to speak, in any way, would suffer the consequences of treason. So here is implying that you'd, you'd be in a position where God should be looking at you as treason, that you're coming against God. So value the other person's human life because they're made in the image of God. So if you're picking on them, you're picking on God. And if we'd remember that, wow, what a difference that would make in our world, everything short of murder also, when we're picking on and condemning and, and not liking for everything from the color of the skin to the position they hold. I mean, we find every reason to complain and gripe and have attitudes of anything, but saying, wow, that brother of mine was made in the image of God, just like me. Amazing. It gives us a whole different thought. But back on here where it says, by man his blood shall be shed. Again, this was to keep there from being the universal violence. Remember, by the time Noah entered the ark, it was only his family that was living unto the Lord, and everyone else, all their thoughts were evil continually. I can only imagine the murder and the mayhem that was taking place on the face of the earth, wherever, however far mankind went. The anarchy before the flood. I mean, people must have just been, you get mad, you just pull out your sword and chop off the head. I don't know, but it must have been just absolutely horrible. Now with justice being given, delegated to man, 
and the capital punishment being in place, it's going to imply that there are established laws, that there are um, the human consequences, that there's, how do I say it? If it's unrelegated, if, it's, if there isn't law, if it's anarchy, there's going to be consequences for that. People can't just get away with it. Um, if they didn't stop them, it would lead to the same way it was when Noah went on the ark. Murder would be continuous. Other crimes would be continuous. The Bible consistently teaches us that the punishment of the guilty is the role of human government. This is right. God did say to establish that. Let me take you quickly all the way over into the, the new covenant. Let me take you to Romans. Romans chapter 13, which tells us about our world today, how we should be in our world today. And let's see what God said about the law of the land in that day, because someone might be saying to me, well, you're going too far back. Okay, let's see if God made changes. Let's bring it more into what governs us today. And chapter 13 of Romans verse 1 says, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. You mean I have to obey the ones over me in the land? I have to be obedient to the governor of California and to the president of the United States? But what if I don't like them? <laughs> and y'all know where I'm going, okay? For there is no authority except from God, and those who which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and, they've, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation on themselves. In other words, when you're saying, I don't like that leader, and I want to do away with that leader, you're saying, I don't like what you've put there, God, and I'm going to do away with what you want, God, and I'm going to do what I want. That's how seriously God is telling us to take the authorities that are over us, because these authorities have been established by God. Rulers are not there, verse 3, for rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior. If you're behaving, you've got nothing to worry about. I don't live in fear that I'm going to have my life demanded of me tomorrow in the court system because I'm abiding by the laws of the land. That's what is being said here. But if you're doing evil, then it's different. Uh, do you want to have no fear of authority? Then do what is good and you'll have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. It's to keep everybody in line. I'm thankful for laws. I'm thankful even when I don't like the speed limit that there are speed limits so that we're safe on the roads. You know, I mean, it's just, it's basic. But if you do what is evil, then be afraid. For it is not, I'm sorry, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Now that's what law should be doing. It should be meeting out what is God's will. So when God says, if you take another human life, then your life is required. That's what God is saying. Now we all know that there are laws made that are contrary to God. When the laws are contrary to God, then we know we are obedient to God rather than to man. But I'm talking in the practicality of the normal every day. God is not telling you, take out your gun and shoot your neighbor because you don't like where they parked the car, <laughs> okay, and, et cetera, et cetera. And where we have laws of our land that now are not biblically based, that's where we pray for a change, where we speak up and try to make changes, but as far as we can live in obedience to God, complying with the law of the land, we are to do so. And I will also say, and it's my, my way of saying it, but I will also say, if you would spend as much time, and when I say that you, it's in general, but if you would spend as much time on your knees praying for the leader that you're complaining about, would we see a difference? Prayer versus gripe. I wonder which one's going to accomplish more. <laughs> okay, back to Genesis 9. I'm not here to be on my soapbox, but it will, the laws of the land carried out properly, the authority given by God to man will restrain man's depravity. We even see in third world countries where there, God is not as, uh, you know, the people aren't aware of the God of creation we even see it there the laws in the lands that are very strong against stealing if you steal you lose your hand have very little stealing go on in their countries 
the laws are made to hold people back, that they feel there is a consequence for their acting out. But if you let it go unpunished, your land will be defiled. And that's what Numbers tells us. Go with me to Numbers chapter 35. And we will pick up in verse 31. Budmid bar in Hebrew, Numbers 35. And we'll pick up in verse 31. And the principle carries on down through today, even though this was speaking in relation to Israel. Wow, verse 31 is way down there in the chapter. <laughs> okay, moreover, you shall not take ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall surely be put to death. So if he deserves death, there shouldn't be any plea bargaining. If, that's, if he took life, life's to be taken from him. Moreover, you shall not take, oh, I read that, I'm sorry. Verse 32, you shall not take ransom for him who has fled to his city of refuge that he may return to live in the land before the death of the priest. So you shall not pollute the land in which you are for blood pollutes the land and no expiation can be made for the land for the blood that is shed on it except by the blood of him who shed it. In other words, if you let someone kill someone, that blood goes into the earth. The only way to, to, to come against that is for their blood to be shed. If you just let it go, then it's polluting your land. That's what they're trying, what the scripture is trying to say here. Verse 34, you shall not defile the land in which you live, in the midst of which I dwell. For I, the Lord, am dwelling in the midst of the sons of Israel. So God was laying it down very clearly. I'm in your midst and I do not want the land polluted by actions like Cain in the past killing Abel. And the land cried out. The blood was crying out for justice. God's not going to condone any unlawful killing of any kind. And that's what he's calling against. When we get into the time called law, we know, and that's, I'm starting with the Ten Commandments there, we know there is thou shalt not murder. Okay, now, as soon as we hit on that, you have people say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute then we've got a problem because of war and we've got a problem because you know what am i supposed to not not murder maybe i'm not supposed to murder that spider i stepped on <laughs> there's all kinds of you know men's ideas that they try to bring in but the mosaic law which was established in no, in exodus chapter 21 you can read it in verses 12 to 17 you will see again that that capital punishment is uh, upheld here and you will see that it's by man he's not to shed the blood of another man that does not mean that there is not time when killing takes place killing takes place in defense in capital punishment because otherwise you'd have to say the ones carrying out capital punishment now need to be put to death because they took the blood of this man but in in these cases in war you there are times there has to be killing what about accidental killing there are reasons why they do not have the consequence of their life being taken from them but there's a world of difference between killing and murder i think you understand you know the difference in what god is coming against so here's what he's establishing even before law he's giving it to noah he's telling them now in order for the land not to become as polluted as it was in noah's day here is a law to help hold back that depravity of sin that law should be upheld and when you say yeah there are world is getting as bad as it was in the days of Noah. I'll say, yes, I agree. And how many of the laws are being upheld in the way that God intended for them to be? And you have to admit, we're finding every excuse from, well, my mama fed me too many Twinkies to I didn't have a mama or whatever or whatnot, the excuses and the reasonings that, that have come in by man to do away with the standard that God said, no, this is it this is where it's at now we're down to verse 7 back in in Bereshit in genesis 9 and verse 7 is very important because our human race is now eight bodies eight living souls that's it we've got mr and mrs noah and we know that noah is 600 years old and then we've got three sons we know that, that the three sons were about 100 when they went into um, the ark. So a lot younger than Noah and his wife. But anyway, 
as for you, God speaking to Noah and his family, as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. Um, in the Hebrew, I love it. Swarm over the earth and multiply in it. As soon as I hear the word swarm, I see swarms. I see a whole sea of fish. I see, you know, a lot of life. Um, God basically was saying, produce life and live it. Fill the earth. Fill the earth. Do you remember that being given to someone else? I'll leave that. I'll come back and say who if you're not getting it. I, somebody out here is a whisper dancer, and they're right. I don't want to leave them hanging and wondering, but we're going to look at a comparison in just a bit. If we don't get to it today, we will next week. But verse 9 now, I think we're ready for it. Um, verse 8, I don't know if I made it clear. No, I didn't. Verse 8 makes it clear. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying. So God's giving specific directions. He's speaking to the human race. He's speaking to the whole family. He's speaking to all that is left. He's speaking to every human being at this, at this point, at this time. And our Hebrew tells us it's very emphatic. I, I will, I'm about to, I myself. God's making it very clear. God is doing it. And that's what we see here. Now behold, and behold, you know, from Revelation, that's, hello, are you getting this? This is important. I. I myself establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. So this is the same personal emphasis that was that, uh, okay, I'm saying this poorly. God emphasized a sentence of doom. He was going to bring the flood on the world. He was going to judge the world and the human race with the exception of Noah and his family would be wiped off. With that same emphasis now, he is saying, I'm going to, in my mercy, establish covenant with you and with your descendants, not just with Noah and his wife and the sons and their wives, but all those that he just told them to have, all those kids and grandkids and great grands and all the nieces and the nephews and the you know, all of that, God saying, I, I'm going to be involved. I'm going to enter covenant. And this covenant is because God loves. His love caused him to wipe out what was so evil also. But now we're going to see his mercy poured out. And he even promises beyond the, the kids and the greats and all that. It even goes to all those swarming things. It goes to all the animals, too, because look at verse 10. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that comes out of the ark, even every beast of the earth. So all the animals that went into the ark, that have come out of the ark now, that are going to be the animal life that continues on on the face of the earth, God is saying, my covenant's on them also. And this covenant we're going to see is a promise to never wipe them out with a flood again. That God's saying, I, I'll just never do that again. And we know he doesn't. He hasn't to this day. And we know that the future time when this earth suffers the judgment that it deserves, it will be by fire. It will not be by flood. And it's a whole different way. And I'm talking all the way just before we go into eternity future in case if you're not understanding. But here we are again now to the human life, to the animal life. God's providing um, providential care. He's recognizing that these are his created beings, and he is establishing a covenant with them. So he says it again in verse 11. I establish my covenant with you. Now, notice God's establishing the covenant with Noah. You know, Noah is representing the human, the human race for us, okay? So God's establishing the covenant with Noah, and because God's the one establishing it, it's going to be unconditional. It's not going to be conditioned on Noah having to do A, B, C, and D, and then you get. This is called an unconditional covenant. And God is making it with Noah, not Noah making it with God. So we don't have a human bargaining with God. Well, if I live perfectly, 
will you not do this again? No, we have instead God saying, I'm promising you, I'm never going to do this again. I'm establishing a covenant with you, a relationship with you, and I'm the one doing it, and I, God, am doing it unconditionally. I'm doing it because of who I am and what I'm gifting, okay? Now, covenant um, is mentioned eight times in here, and the number eight means new beginnings. We've got a new start. We've got like a fresh new covenant. It's not called the new covenant because that is definitely a, a different covenant. It's the covenant of the blood of Yeshua Jesus that brings us into new life. But here, if, we, if you want to look at it, uh, and you can drop down in your scriptures if you can see your whole page, you'll find that covenant, that word is mentioned in verse 9, 11, 12, 13, 15, 16, and 17. And then you go back and you look real quick at chapter 6 and verse 18, and you will see that's our seventh time that it was mentioned. Okay, so Genesis 6, 18, I'll read it for you quickly. And it says, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons, your wife and your son's wives with you. So in chapter six and verse 18, God's saying, Noah, I'm gonna put you on the ark, you and your family, and I'm gonna make a covenant with you. Now we've gone through the time on the ark. They've come off of the ark and God is saying, okay, I'm making a covenant with you, with your family, with, excuse me, with all of you. So uh, we've got seven times that is mentioned in chapter nine. Seven is completion, is a perfect number in scripture. We see that he has completed what he intended to do with the ark, with the family through the time on the ark. And now looking at it for the eighth mention of the covenant with Noah, we see he's bringing him into a new beginning. So we'll go back to chapter nine to see what this new beginning looks like. And that's what I keep tantalizing us. And we haven't listened fast enough, so we've stayed a little in between, but now we're really starting to get into this new covenant. And I'm trying to get back to chapter nine, which my tablet does not want to do. Okay, let's try it another way then. They updated me last week and it just never has worked the same since. I may be throwing something at you, Roger, to fix later if you can. Okay, uh, so verse 11, back to that new covenant, the eighth time mentioned, seventh time, in, well, not yet quite the seventh in this chapter. We're, we're getting there, though. I will establish my covenant with you, and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood. Neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. No doubt going through this experience, this flood, when there was nothing known about rain, water in that sense before, it could have absolutely shook man's confidence. It, it made it, uh, you know, the established order of nature went awry. It, I would equate it with us if suddenly, let's say the sun burned up and God gave us a new sun the next day, we'd be, okay, is this ever going to happen? It, it, sh it can shake their foundation. We can go through something that shakes our foundation. This probably did. And it no doubt put even more of a fear into Noah and his family. Wow, this God is powerful. And if he gets upset enough, he can just choose to wipe out. It's gone. If anyone's ever worked with someone in that situation where they've seen a boss flare off in anger and fire someone in anger, what does it do to the rest of the staff? Ooh, I better stay in line because if he flies off in anger toward me, my head will be the next one on the chopping block. It could have been about how no one his family felt a little insecure. Their land, the ground under their feet, was still a little shaky to them. And so God's not wanting them to live with that fear. He's wanting to set their minds at ease and he's establishing with them, I'm not going to ever do this again. This judgment that had to come was severe, but this is this it's, it's done now. It also tells us once again that this was not just a local flood because I'll ask you the question, have there been people who've lost life and floods since Noah's day. Yes. Anybody listen to last night's news? It made me cry. What has happened to families in Kentucky who have lost loved ones. 
So if God was saying no one will ever lose their life in a local flood again, then he hasn't kept his word. But that's not what he's saying. He's saying he'll never judge the whole world with the flood like that again. So it had to have been a worldwide flood or we have a God who doesn't keep his word. And I 100%, 1,000%, million percent guarantee you God keeps his word. Um, so God is establishing it again, or not again, but establishing the new covenant. And he's going to to help them feel secure he's going to give them do i want to call it evidence i don't know they want to call it evidence but he's going to give them a sign okay god said verse 12 this is the sign of the covenant which i'm making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all successive generations okay because we've cheated we've read on we know what he's talking about so i'm going to jump in there and just say He's talking about the rainbow. And the rainbow is something that requires both sunlight and the cloud, the, the liquid in, in the cloud, the rain, you know, the rain drops of droplets in the air. That's why you can see a rainbow in a sprinkler because it has all the elements that are needed. You know, it's not that it's, it's just in the sky. It's, it's where you've got sunlight, you've got a cloud, you've got water. I'm saying this so poorly. I will get better when we hit on the rainbow. <laughs> I will get there. But before the flood, the upper air only had an invisible water vapor. It didn't have raindrops. It didn't have rain. We've talked about that. So there was no way for a rainbow to appear in the world prior to this time. Noah and his family never saw a rainbow before. That's what I'm trying to bring out. God's doing something brand new. And with that water vapor in the camp gone, it's also physically impossible. With God, all things are possible. But it's physically impossible now to have enough water to rain from the atmosphere and, and how the ground broke up and all that to be a universal flood again. Before the canopy broke up, it had the ability because of the canopy. Now with it gone, physically it's not possible without God you know, intervening and making it different. And he's assuring that he's not going to. And he's even saying, look, I'm going to give you something to see, something tangible. How many say, if I can see it, then I'll believe it. Well, Noah, you can see this. I'm not just telling you, I'm going to show you. I'm giving you the sign of this covenant that I'm making with you and not just with you, but with every living creature and not just for right now, but for all future or all perpetual, whatever your translation says, for all generations, the Hebrew makes it very clear, generations of eternity. That covers it all. That doesn't run out. How long is eternity? Long A long time is longer than that. It is eternity. forever. <laughs> yes, eternity is eternal. <laughs> we'll put it that way. Okay, so God is saying all the way down, that's why today we don't pray, oh, Lord, don't cover this whole world with a flood. We know that's not what's going to come. We don't live in that fear. So God did a good job of assuring mankind because I'm not the closest generation to when this happened. Okay, let's look at what he gave them. Verse 13, I set, and this is God speaking still, I set my bow in the cloud. And it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. Okay, set. It does not mean that it comes into existence now. It means that this, this, this is an investment with a character. It's, he's not saying I'm creating a sign. But he's investing his covenant with something that has existed before. Okay, they couldn't see the rainbow before. But it's not the creation of the rainbow. Anybody know when the creation of the rainbow was? I got everybody thinking, don't I? <laughs> no, that's the whole point. From the Hebrew, from the being set, it's showing this is not coming into existence now. It's now something that's in the sky of Noah, where Noah can see it. He could not see a rainbow before. 
but it's not a creation. If I take you back to Genesis 1, we had original creation. We saw some things weren't originally created. We saw when God created man, when God created the animal life. Okay, where do we read? Genesis 13. Genesis 13? Yeah. What does 5, Genesis 13 5, say? 5, 5, 13. <laughs> what does Genesis 5.13 say? Uh, I put my rainbow in the cloud. It will be there as a sign of the covenant between myself and the earth. Okay, that's a chapter we're in right now. That's chapter nine. Yeah, well, yeah, sorry. That's right here, right now. And I'm saying, no, God's making it very clear. This is something that He's bringing into the existence, but it's not something He's creating right now. They can now. They couldn't see it because of the water vapor and the conditions were not right to see it. Scientifically speaking, the way God allows us to see a rainbow was impossible before after the flood okay rowena you're trying to get in there you got an answer for us she's trying got her hand going keep trying to unmute how about from eternity past in the throne of god I'll give you an A++. She not only said eternity past, but she told us where that we get our proof. The throne of God. Did the throne of God ever not exist? Has God ever not been on the throne? Is God always, did God ever begin? No, God didn't begin. The throne he sits on didn't begin. So if we've got a rainbow there, we've got a rainbow from eternity. And if I could get, there we go, if I could get my tablet to work, I'm going to take you all the way to Revelation. I'm taking you to the end to see the beginning. <laughs> okay. We're going to time travel. How did they do that? They went, you know, they went into the future to see the past. I don't remember. I'm probably saying that exact opposite of what I should. Go with me to Revelation 13. Um, you know what? It's not Revelation 13. Forgive me. It's Revelation 4. Sorry. I was in Revelation 13 earlier today. <laughs> I guarantee you it's not there. <laughs> Revelation 4. And very early in Revelation 4, and I'm still having trouble with my tablet, so some of you may be able to get there before me. There we go. This time it worked. Revelation 4 and verse 3 says, and he, and I'll tell you if you back up, um, let me just tell you real fast. Verse 1, Yochanan John, the author of Revelation, is writing. He's the one who's seeing. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. He gets called up in verse 1. Immediately in the spirit, he is in heaven, and he beholds a throne that was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. The only one who sits on the throne in heaven is God and God alone. Of course, I don't mean apart from Yeshua Jesus. It's a love seat built for two. You all know that. The Lord Jesus sits on the right hand of the Father, so they are two in one. I'm not talking, you know, I'm not separating those two, but Satan never sits on the throne in heaven, and he's not God's equal and opposite. I love the picture, Rowena. I don't know if others can see your screen, but I love it. We've got a, a rainbow around the throne also, but here in verse 3 it says, he who was sitting was like a jasper stone. That's like our diamond. We'll talk about that in more detail in a bit and a sardius, an appearance that's red, and there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. That's why in her picture, it's a green rainbow. So there's a rainbow around the throne in heaven. Yochanan is just getting to see it. He's been caught up to see a heavenly vision, but we don't read that it was just created then, do we? Heaven wasn't just created then. God sitting on the throne wasn't just created, and the rainbow around the throne, and we're going to see even more personal than that in just a bit, but I won't tip my hand to that, but the rainbow is around God's throne. So God is taking something, something very personal. I'm going to show you from the Hebrew just how personal it is, and he is bringing that into Noah's life in a way now that Noah can see it, literally see it. So back in Genesis 9, when we read, I do set my bow, or it doesn't even have the word do there. I set my bow. Okay, the Hebrew root word is from Natan, and it means gift. So when he set his rainbow, 
into the sky that no could see. He's drawing his attention to it. He's saying, this is the sign that, of the covenant that I'm making with you. He basically says, I am gifting you this rainbow. The rainbow is a gift from God. It's belong to him. It's really a part of him. We'll see how that is more as we go on. But he is gifting it to Noah and to all the generations that come after Noah. I love to give the meaning for the word rainbow and acrostic. I take the letters R-A-I-N-B-O-W, and I say it is redemptive, arch, is never-ending, blessing of wonder. This rainbow is going to speak to us in its entirety of the gift of salvation. That's a never-ending blessing, and that's a wonder. Wow. So that's how I like to say it. But I'll give you more as we go along. I'm going to keep us to Genesis just a little bit here. Give us a little more from this, the verses we're in. And then I'll dive off into our study, our subtopic for today, our study of the rainbow. And I'll bring you out a whole complete picture. But right here back in Genesis 9, we have now that he set his bow, my bow. It's God's, okay? And the bow, the word from the Hebrew, because there can be different words for bow, just like we have different words. We have bow and arrow, and we have a bow in a person's hair. You know, we have different words that sound alike. Well, when we look at this in the Hebrew, this word for bow in, in the Hebrew means a battle bow, okay? A battle bow, like the bow and arrow, something that's used in battle. It's not looked at like a bow in, in a girl's hair, okay? This is a battle bow. So the bow is a sign. It's a token of the covenant where God is ratifying a promise with mankind, and it's his bow. He is saying, this is mine. I'm gifting this to you, Noah, and to all mankind. The bow was not only to assure man that the earth wouldn't be destroyed by flood again, but it's also to be like a memorial or remembrance of a new relationship that God has entered into with his creation. He's bringing them in in a different way now, and we're going to see that as we continue to study, but that's where I'll say just hold on to that thought. There's going to be a couple more thoughts, and then we'll go and look at the stay on the rainbow, and you're going to go, oh, I get it, I get it, and I get it. Okay, so just hang tight. And let me read just a little bit more. It shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow will be seen in the cloud. This is verse 19. Okay, when God makes this happen, when God brings it about, when he brings the clouds together, he, in the Hebrew it's saying, in my gathering the clouds, I'll gift my bow. Okay, and why is he doing this? What's it supposed to memorialize for the people? It's actually more memorializing for God also. He's going to remember too, verse 15, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. You see why I get the idea this must have really shook their confidence. It must have really left them a bit fearful and a bit intimidated by this great power of this great God. Because again, he's saying, I'm never going to do this to you again, not to human life and not to the animal life. And God is saying, when you see the rainbow, I will remember. It's not just Noah. It's not just us. God's saying, I'm going to be remembering that I've promised this to you. Yes, Rhonda. We're trying. Okay. I was just kicked out, so I didn't get to hear what you were saying about the redemptive arch. Uh, oh, is never-ending blessing of wonder. That when we go through the whole rainbow, you're going to see it's a picture of salvation. That's what I mean by the redemptive arch. It, it redeem, redemptive, you know, redemption, redemption's arch, you could say that way too, is never-ending blessing of wonder. Wow. That's so, amazing that God loves so, you. So, so we're saying that because God is eternal, the rainbow always was existing, as explained in Revelation 4, 3, 
So when it happened, it wasn't that because the canopy um, disappeared, it was because it was in heaven and then God gifted it to Noah. Right. So it's Brought not it. because there was no rain before, it's because it was always in heaven. Yeah. Right, right. They just couldn't see it. The conditions weren't right. And now God's bringing it in where it can be seen. The same way, remember when we looked at um, the establishment, what God created new and afresh out of nothing was animal life and human life. But we saw that, that it sounded very much like the sun and the moon were brought into play in relation to earth. That it wasn't the time he created those, but he, he made them work in our world. Now he's brought this rainbow, this gift of himself into Noah's world. So now Noah can see it. So the rainbow was before, and I'll tell you, the rainbow goes all the way to the end. We'll see that because we'll get there. We're just not there yet. So when you see this, when you see this rainbow, when you see this sign of the covenant, I will remember this covenant that I've made with you, verse 15. And then verse 16, when the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it. Who's looking on the rainbow? God, God is. You ever thought about that when you're looking at a rainbow? I'm looking up at a rainbow and God's looking down at that rainbow. Whoa, that's a connection. That's a covenant. That's a partnership that we've come together and is unconditional because God made it and God didn't put conditions on it. So verse 16, when the bow is in the cloud, then I, God, will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant. Do you get what he keeps emphasizing over and over and over and over? I'm never going to flood the earth again. This is everlasting. I am going to keep my word. Here's a sign to remind you every time you see it, be reassured. Because I could imagine next time it started raining, Noah could say, uh-oh, is it going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights? Do I need to run back to the ark? Come on, animals, let's get in. <laughs> and some days when we've had some, some winters that has rained and rained and rained or in places where they have a lot of rain, they might think. And we've even joked, well, maybe it's time to build the ark. You know, maybe we better get our oars out and find where the ark went. Okay, we make those jokes that we know. God has promised everlasting covenant between God, the living creatures, the flesh that is on the earth. That's verse 16 again. I'm not just repeating it. God's repeating it and then verse um uh, let me say also here the everlasting covenant in verse 16 again unconditional god's the initiator god's the keeper god is, he's not giving man a part in this he didn't say noah earn this he didn't say as long as you stay right with me he made it absolutely unconditional he didn't put any conditions for man on it he just said i'm not going to do this ever again to man or to the animals and now i want to take you to isaiah 54 9 and 10 yeshia chapter 54 and verses 9 and 10 in this these verses we read for this is like the days of noah to me god speaking when i swore that the waters of noah would not flood the earth again so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you, nor will I rebuke you. For the mountains may be removed, the hills may shake, but my loving kindness will not be removed from you, and my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord who has compassion on you. So God's telling Israel, I'm going to have compassion on you. The mountains may be removed, the hills may shake, all this may happen, but my loving kindness it will not be removed from you, and my covenant of peace, of shalom that I'm making with you will not end just the same way I told Noah it wouldn't happen again for him. And from Noah down to Isaiah, do I know how many years? Um, I'm going to say it's over 700 years. Isaiah is about 700 B.C., We've got to go more than that. We've got to go about 800 years or more between Noah and Isaiah. I didn't think to look up how much because I didn't realize how I was going to phrase it. But let me just say for years and years and years and years, I'm sure that the earth saw rain. I'm sure that there were areas that flooded, that God was keeping his word faithful. And this was encouragement 
to Isaiah, when I'm making a faithful covenant with Israel, I'm going to keep that covenant just like I have with Noah. So it carries a lot of weight. And should it speak to you all the way down today? Yes, what God has promised you, you can, as I said earlier, take it to the bank. You're guaranteed. You can count on it. When God says, this is it, no conditions attached, that's it. What am I referring to? I'm going to say it right out front. My salvation. I do not fear that tomorrow I will not be saved. God said that I'm saved still by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, until my little feet are set in heaven where nothing can come through to harm, to break, to, to destroy ever again. That's the same thing. Why is a rainbow a redemptive arch? Because it's God's plan of redemption that's unconditional that we see pictured. And that's just the beginning. So we have an everlasting covenant with Noah. We have an unconditional covenant. We have man having no part in it. It's not up to man. And I say, hallelujah. Yeah, thank goodness. Because if it was dependent on me, if God said, well, Rochelle, as long as you live right, as long as you live righteous, as long as you don't do this, all I'd end up doing is, is losing it. But God does not allow that. God has done it unconditionally. And hallelujah, praise him and thank him. Now, we're going to see just a few of the conditions of the Noah covenant. And then I'm going to bring you um, where else we see the rainbow in scripture. Yeah, just a tiny bit more, then we'll go into that total rainbow study. But I think if I give you the overall, then when I'm giving you so much in it, it's going to click off in your mind. So I can come back to this. I'll say it kind of quickly. But under the Noah covenant, what God's making with Noah now, we know it's different than how it was before the flood. It's not the time of conscience now. It's not the time of innocence now. Those times have passed. Now we're dealing with human government. So man's going to rule over man. That's to protect the sanctity of life. That's to keep orderly rule. That's why there has to be capital punishment. If man didn't have that threat of his life being taken, he'd just freely go whack whoever he wanted when he got angry. But something's got to stop him. At the same time, we saw last week that God said he would not put any additional curse on the ground. There wasn't going to be any more curse, and there would never be another universal flood we see today. The order of nature we saw last week was confirmed that there would now be these seasons. And we also saw at the same time that God said the animals would now fear man. There was no fear before. The wild animals didn't eat man. Man didn't eat the animals. Now we've got a change and we do see fear entered in. Flesh is added to man's diet and blood is not to be eaten. And there also is a prophetic declaration of the descendants of the three sons that's been given. And that's what we saw. It's, is it going to come up again? I think it's going to come up again. Um, yes, yes. Here's where it's prophetic. Verse 19, we're jumping down real quick. We're going to go right back up. That these three were the sons of Noah, and they'd just been named in verse 18. And from these, the whole earth was populated. So where we were told, be fruitful, multiply, God already prophetically spoke and said the whole earth was populated by these three. And they're absolutely right. All of us come from either Ham, Ham Shem, or Japheth, Japheth. Okay, so God prophetically told and it is there. Now, I want to go back to that bow before I show you the other places. It is in, a, in scripture. I want to remind you that we've said the Hebrew for it is a battle bow. It's a bow used like bow and arrow. Okay, and used for war, used in a battle. This bow has no arrow. We don't see an arrow, do we? Anybody ever seen an arrow in the rainbow? No, we don't. Okay, that's because the judgment has already been released. And it's as if this battle bow has been hung, which suggests the battle's over. Okay, took out, shot the arrow, took the rainbow, and hung it. He hung it in space. He hung it a little lower than it had been hung before so that Noah could see it. But the battle's over. The storm is over. The rainbow speaks of shalom. It speaks of peace. After judging man, 
God makes a covenant of shalom with man. How do we come into peace with man? A man come into peace with God? We know last week we said it was through the blood. The blood wasn't through our blood. Our blood doesn't bring peace with God. Our blood brings condemnation with God. But we know that the blood of the Son of God is what brings us shalom, brings us peace. So that rainbow has got to be speaking to us about the blood of the Son. Hang tight. You'll see how. Let me give you an example in Scripture also. Um, this is especially for any of our Jewish-minded people who have been following the parashas because this was just a week ago when I thought we were going to be into this. We've just come through, or maybe in two weeks now, the time when we, we read about Pinchas in Scripture. That may be a name you're not familiar with, but trust me, in the story, he stepped up to the plate. There was a priest who should have been representing God to the people, and the priest was doing something very wrong, um, blatantly sinning, uh, making a spectacle of it, and in essence, he took a gal and he went into the tent in the face of all of Israel, and you can fill in the blank and you won't be wrong. Pincus stood up to this. He knew it was wrong, and especially for the one who's supposed to be representing God to the people, and he charged into that tent and killed both of the participants who were coming against, who are just flagrantly attacking God's law, God's way. Pichas, his name means mouth and either serpent or brass. It can go either way in the Hebrew. Brass in scripture speaks of judgment. And we see a brass serpent that was lifted up when the children of Israel were being bitten by vipers and were dying, that God told Moshe to make this brass serpent to lift it up on the pole. And as they looked up to this, they would be spared from death. We see the one who was lifted up on a tree rather than a pole. And the ones who looked to him are brought from judgment into life. And we're speaking of Yeshua Jesus. We know that was what it was a picture of. So the same way that we gain a covenant of peace through looking up at the one who brought was lifted up on a pole or on a tree, who judgment was put on that one, the wage of sin being death, it brings us into that place of eternal life. So is this a foreign thought in scripture? No, this is something we see again and again. God keeps bringing us this. He brings us a picture of salvation, of covenant, of peace with him in many different ways. And the rainbow is going to just be one of them. Yes. How do you spell the name of that person? He is in Peter. I-N-C-H-A-S. C-H? Uh, C-H. C. Pin, P-I-N, like a safety, like a safety pin. And then C H A S. Um, I should be able to give you the reference. I'll look up the reference later and I'll bring it if, for anyone else who wants it, or just Google search Pincus in the Bible and you'll get the story. Um, I'm thinking it's in Numbers because we're in Numbers. I think it's middle of the book of Numbers. I should know this. I just taught on it. Was there, I should know it. Was there a this son of Moses or Aaron. Phineas that did something. Uh, there is a Phineas in scripture. This is Pinchas. Name is close. Okay, did not Phineas do the same thing? I believe so. I believe if I remember right, maybe maybe this was even the, the same. But I'm going, I bet you I bet I'll bet you it is the same and one's the English name and one's the Hebrew name. I'll bet you anything. <laughs> Um, I will look that up for you better because sometimes when I'm used to the Hebrew, I don't remember the English and vice versa. But I think I think it is the same story. It's just why I'm holding back is there's a time with Eli that there's a name very similar. But I think Phineas and Pinchas might be the two that one's English, one's Hebrew. But you'll you'll find it. And if you don't, Aaron's. Could be right, could be right. I, I'm trying, my mind's so scrambled right now. I'm trying to um, 
because this one gets rewarded with being he's brought into the priestly line and his family wasn't in the priestly line but that's what he's rewarded with and his his children after him oh. um so that's why i'm thinking maybe maybe not look okay um it is Phineas in English, so you may need to find it that way in your Bible. Um, P H I N E H A S, the son of Eliezer. He's so incensed at the sight of the Israelite consorting with the Midianite woman that he kills them both, ending the plague that God that has broken out and earning God's special favor, which was a covenant of perpetual priesthood with him and with his descendants so phineas in english p-h-i-n-e-h-a-s um he comes into the line the grandson of aaron the son of eliezer the high priest is is distinguished but he wasn't in that priestly position he's granted it okay that was that was his reward it can be spelled without that second h also in your english if you have trouble finding out let me know i'm looking real quick i'm looking if any of these give me the okay numbers 25 verses 7 through 13. It looks like he was in the family, but again, I know he's rewarded with with the priesthood. I'm going to have to go research on that part because it made it clear he wasn't in that specific position, and God brought the family in from then on. Numbers 25, 7 through 13. Okay, priestly line and reward okay i'll do my research i'll bring that back to you all next week that was a sidetrack i didn't expect to go down sorry so and uh you think you know it and then someone asks you a question you realize okay wait a minute i gotta put this together and figure it out but anyway you get the idea and we're going to see it um i think it can still give us boy i don't know i you know i may just build this up for the rainbow and then bring it in its full study next week because like I said, I don't want to split it in half. I want to take the whole thing together. So I don't mean to tantalize or make a promise and not keep it. I hope you're not looking at me that way. It's just, you know, we want to get the full study. We don't want to um, hurry to get to something. So it, hopefully you're all okay if we don't. I'll see how we go along. But let me give you the other places where the rainbow is mentioned in scripture. And maybe I can give you a little like tail end and then bring you back to the beginning next week and if so we'll start with it next week so it'll be there um go with me to Ezekiel, ezekiel chapter one okay and having my tablet not work well it is also part of the problem but i do get there eventually ezekiel chapter one we're going to look at verses 26 and 28 this is the second mention of the rainbow in scripture, our first Genesis 9. So we've got a time, you know, that's that's going down. Um, and I don't mean just like Isaiah mentioned the bow, you know, the, the, I'm talking about seeing, okay? So Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapter one, verse 26 says, now above the expanse that was over their heads, there was resembling a throne like lapis lazuli. I don't even know how to say that in appearance and on that which resembled a throne high up was a figure with the appearance of a man so in verse 26 ezekiel is seeing a something like a throne it is luxurious it's it's shimmering like like if it was made out of diamonds i think that's the color of lapis lazuli if i remember right anyway uh, he sees something resembling a throne. It's high up, high and lifted up. There's a figure on the throne like the appearance of a man. So he's saying it's not exactly a man, but it looks, you know, the appearance like a man sitting on this throne, high and lifted up. Verse 28, which we're jumping down. Verse 20 says, as the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day. So we know now he's talking about Noah's rainbow. 
as the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the surrounding radiance. So this one who was sitting on the throne, there's a rainbow around him. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard a voice speaking. So Ezekiel, Ezekiel, as he's giving us this vision that he's seeing, he's seeing this wow this throne is that's like on fire maybe it was even more fiery than diamonds because i know there's a fiery throne so i'll have to look up lapis luzi maybe maybe let's see what my jewish bible tells me um amber colored fire radiating so okay so think of the diamonds on fire you know when they're they're shining and you see fiery like that this throne was something amazing to be seen as high as looked up there's the appearance of one like a man that's sitting on this throne and around him is this rainbow it's like the rainbow that that noah saw so the rainbow that we read in revelation 4 3 that's all emerald is around the throne but now we got a rainbow around the one on the throne so we've got a rainbow inside of a rainbow it's not just the same one and this one this one that's around it looks just like the one you see that god gave to Noah on a rainy day and he is so in awe and he's realizing it's like i'm i'm getting a view of the glory of the lord and what's it cause him to do Meow fall on his face in adoration, in worship, and in praise. That's the scene we're seeing. Dora? Are we going to remember all of this? I mean, yes. Absolutely. I fully expect that. Yes. Yes. She's asking, when we get to heaven, are we going to remember all this? And when we see that rainbow, are we going to fall on our faces? I think so. And that's why I love that song that says, am I going to jump and shout hallelujah, or am I going to fall on my face and worship in, a, in adoration? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Not either or. I think we're going to do both. I think we're going to pick ourselves back up, only to look at it again and go down again. <laughs> Sore wow <laughs> what can i say roger's saying a lot of sore noses nope soreness not allowed in <laughs> no boo boots no owies no nothing anymore but yes i we're going to go up and remember more than what we're remembering now because we'll have that new body we'll have that new mind that is like messiahs we're going to learn through all the eternity i don't believe we ever equate god's mind that we're going to, it's not going to be a lack, and it's not going to be a lack of understanding or anything like that. I mean, I don't know how to tell you, but I do guarantee you, no, you're going to remember more, you're going to know more. They're not walking up there in heaven with name tags on saying, I'm King David, I'm Elijah, I'm Ruth, I'm Esther. <laughs> we're going to know who they are. That's amazing. And for those of you who question, who wonder, and I never understand why people can even wonder, are we going to know our loved ones? How would you know less? You're going to know more. So yes, you're going to know your loved ones. Yes, we're going to recognize them. Yes, they're ahead of us, but we're coming right on their shirt tails, their coat tails, and we will not be lacking. We're not going to need to be introduced. But it's in a capacity that we cannot understand now. And I fully do believe that, that when we see, we are going to be in such awe that we are going to spend a lot of time on our faces in that humble adoration. If you have never seen, um, oh, Roger, help me. We sing it quite often in our messianic services. Um, um, no, the one where he goes into the, the throne room of God. Um, yeah, but it, what's it called? I enter the Holy of Holies. Google that. It, put in Messianic praise and worship. And then look for I enter the Holy of Holies and get it by Paul Wilbur, I think it is. And get the one where he, you see this old man. It's John, okay? Walking in, yes. And 
I, I don't know if I've ever seen every scene because I always lose it somewhere in there and my eyes are closed and I'm praising God and the tears are, are, are there. So I don't know if I've seen every scene, but I've not seen one scene that does not fit scripture. And if you can watch that and not feel like you're getting a taste of the first time we walk into the presence of the Lord, into the Holy of Holies in heaven, Oh my goodness, I, I just, for me, it's very touching, very moving, and why I thought of it just now is there's one point, and I can't remember where, but it's early in it, where John, you know, he, he's looking up, and he's, he's in awe, and he, you know, he, he's kind of trying to figure out, and he's being guided, and he's in awe, and then all of a sudden, boom, he's down on his face, and as he looks up, you see this nail print foot to go by. And you know, you know, they never show the face of the Lord. Another reason why I like the song, because that would focus you on a man and they don't. You see, you see glory around him, you see nail prints, you see the miraculous thing moving. You see a hand? Dad, Dad comes down to like almost touch him, and you still see the nail print. Oh, okay. I have not seen that. See, I told you I haven't seen it all. <laughs> it, it, it came from a movie, yes, yes, uh, and the movie's on St. John in Exile, on on his time there, but not the DVD that I showed you all before, you know, it's not that one. Uh, hmm? I'll say one thing. Yes, um, go ahead, speak loud so they can hear you. When you talked about how much we'll know when we're up there, you know, scientists say we only use 10% of our brain here on Earth, and when you think of Einstein, all these guys, how much, they only got 10%, but oh, maybe a little more, but still, how much they know, how much more we'll know when we're up there. Exactly. Exactly. We're not, we're not up to the capacity of our brain by any stretch of the imagination. And just as a little sidelight there, when you uh, learn of these people, I don't like the name, but it's what they're called, idiot savant. And that means that, that for all sake and purposes, they can't tie their own shoes. They can't take care of themselves. They, they have to have this help. But there's one area that they, their mind seems to work in our estimation perfectly. It may be mathematically, it may, you know, whatever way it is. And that's why they call them savant because the savant is a brilliant. And I think that little slice of their brain working almost perfectly is an indication when our whole brain, instead of 10%, crusty and old <laughs> is being used, it begins to give us, you know, an idea of how much capacity and how much more, you know, we're going to have and and yet just stand in ah, oh, just just absolutely amazed and, and humbled by it. God's so great who can create anything. Why is he bothering with me? Why did he reach down? Why did he save me? Why did he keep me? And why does he want me to live with him forever? Hallelujah. There's no other way to say it. <laughs> so this is our amazing God. It does speak to the glory of God. And when you study the Shekhinah glory of God, it is awesome and amazing and defies human explanation. The same way we're going to see when we're done with this. I love this also. The pilots say when they fly into a rainbow, they say that they're flying into the glory. I do believe the rainbow is the glory of God expressed in a way that God's gifted it to humankind. It's amazing. You'll get more of that next week because I can tell by the time it is, we'll go through and we'll be ready for it, but then we will redo it there. Sure. It looks like Okay, okay, that's, yeah, that's after class, but thank you. It was a note from somebody in class, but not about this class. Next time in scripture, we've got Genesis 9. We've got Hezekiel 1, technically verse 28, but I gave you 26 to see the start of the vision to understand 28. The next time it's mentioned, we've already taken that sneak peek, but let's go back there real quickly, and that's to Revelation chapter 4, and verse 3 is the one that I told you I loved Rowena's picture because it so fits the description there. This is around his throne in heaven. So this is the one not around him, it's around his throne. And this one is all emerald green, which makes me think there may be rainbows that are all red and rainbows that are all gold, rainbows that are all green. I don't know, but it makes me think that. And I imagine seeing all those shades of green and, and don't limit it to here because 
our colors are limited. Our colors are tainted by sin. Our, our colors, they say when they show you that pure laser shot that you've never seen true red and you've never seen true blue and you've never seen color, I'll personify it, that dances. So this green is not just, oh, we got one shade of green. Which shade is it? No, I, it's going to be a whole lot more than that. Okay, 4-3, Revelation, and I read. He who was sitting was like a jasper stone. There's our, our jasper. There's our diamond. Sardius in appearance. There's also red mixed in there. You've got the, the white and the red. And if you can't put those two together, stay tuned. I'll put it together for you. There was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. So here in this heavenly scene is our third time that it's specifically called a rainbow. And because even though this scene happened in 96 AD approximately when Yochanan was seeing it, it didn't just suddenly appear for Yochanan. He's entered into heaven, which has been there through eternity. God's home has always been there. God didn't create. Well, let me take that back. Maybe he did create heaven. He created the heavens and the earth is our heavens, but his eternal home anyway, it goes back. It goes further back than our minds can understand. And then our scriptures tell us, and it goes further than than either also following that go to chapter 10 that's why i took you to four again even though we'd seen it because it's so close to chapter 10 this is our fourth and final time that the rainbow is mentioned specifically as being seen yes revelation chapter 10 and verse 1 um, and i'll read the verse and then i'll make the comment because immediately you're going to say wait a minute i got a problem but hold on i saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. We've again got an awesome, wow, vision, like what Hezekiel was seeing. Now, the controversy is whether this is Yeshua or whether this is a, an angel. Um, I lean toward, because of everything else around it, I lean toward it being Yeshua. My problem with that is simply the way it's phrased, I saw another strong angel. The Lord isn't another angel. So I can't say it dogmatically that, oh, I know it's Yeshua because of the, the way that's phrased, but everything else is a description like the Lord. So if it's not the Lord, it's, it's the closest to looking like the Lord that even the angels can get. It would be the 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 closest to him, whichever way it is. Um, this one is claiming dominion over the world. That makes me think that it has to be Yeshua. So you can see, you know, my problem. This is one of those things that at this point I'm asking in heaven if I don't know when I get there <laughs> because I can't get a hundred percent exactly. I see it though in my mind because he's claiming dominion over the throne, over the world. I'm sorry, because of everything else in this area that it's talking about. He has a rainbow on his head rather than a crown of thorns. Came the first time and he wore a crown of thorns and he came to suffer the consequences of death to bring us abundant life. Now he's coming in his glory and he's wearing the rainbow, his glory that he's worthy of and he ushers in the kingdom of shalom, the kingdom of peace. So in that view, I would say, well, it's gotta be Yeshua. But what do I do with that? Another mighty angel. I don't know what to do with it. If we've got it exactly right in our translation, then I got a problem. So one day, one day, and if anybody's got any insight they wanna share with me, I'm open. I just think it's one of those things we'll never be able to 100% dogmatically say that we can get you know awfully close so with seeing the, this now the rainbow how closely connected it is either right around the lord's head in chapter 10 definitely around his throne in chapter 4 definitely when when Hezekiel is seeing a, a vision of the of of god on the throne you've got the rainbow there and now we come back into genesis 9 where i'm going to take us back into Genesis 9, where you have God saying, I am gifting you my bow. I'm setting my something of me into your world. This is what we're getting. And this also makes me think that this rainbow is 
almost in essence a very part of God himself. Um, one way that I can kind of say it that maybe helps us is I've referred sometimes to as his signature, his insignia. Mm, you know, we were, I'm, I'm fighting for how to say it, but we have this something so special, such a gift. It's like the Lord looked around and said, what's going to be the greatest assurance I can give to Noah and to all his descendants after him? I want to give him a piece of me. Oh, I'll give him the rainbow. That, that's how I see it. Okay, that, that he's gifting it. Now, let's go again into a little bit of what this means because we're told in verse 17, God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I've established between me and the flesh that is on the earth. Okay, it's a sign. Now, a sign, you might have the word token in your uh, translation. That's fine also. The bow that he's seen is a joint product of the storm and of the sunshine. That's like a type of God's meeting ground. He meets us at the mercy seat. He meets sinful man. Holy God comes and meets sinful man at the mercy seat. The storm, in essence, is the judgment on the sin. But the sunshine, and I'm going to say the S-O-N, the sunshine, because it's speaking of Mashiach, it's speaking of Messiah, brings peace. The storm is done away with and the peace comes. We get that all at the mercy seat. When they came to the mercy seat, the Shekhinah glory of God dwelt there. That glory is so bright that it has to be camouflaged by the incense that's, that's being brought in so that it doesn't blind the high priest. He would not be able to, to see again if he went straight in without the smoke that comes up from the incense, this glory, this brightness, this, it makes me think of like the rainbow. That's that when it said it was like the glory of God. You know, I think we're seeing something very similar here. And you say to me, okay, but how can you say that the Lord is like the sunshine? Even if I do the play on the spelling, let me take you to a very interesting scripture, and I'll bring this out next week again also. Go with me real quickly to Malachi, Malachi your last book in, your, in the original. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2. Malachi, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, and it is spelled S-U-N, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. The sun of righteousness that rises and brings healing in his wings is none other than Mashiach. That is a, a prophecy, a foreshadowing of Messiah coming. When we, you read earlier, chapter still 4, verse 1, Behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace. All the arrogant evil, every evildoer will be chaffed. The day that is coming will set them ablaze, says Adonai Sabaoth, says the Lord of hosts. That's the day he's coming in judgment. When he's coming in that kind of judge, judgment, the burning fire uh, and all that, that's happening, that he's leaving, he's he's taking out all evil doing so that there's nothing left, not root nor branch. We know that's, that's the end. That's at the battle of Armageddon when he comes back and he annihilates this evil that has been on the face of the earth. And he says, when that happens, you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And if you remember the gospel and the stars, we also saw that pictured in there. And I'll bring that out next week for us also. I won't bother to go into it in depth today, but I'll pick all these these pieces back up and put the whole picture together for you. When we remember signs introduced to us in Genesis chapter one, and last week I reminded us of that, that the signs were to speak of someone or something coming. They were to be prophetic. They were for a purpose. What will be the sign of his coming? We're asked in Matthew 24, and the Lord gives the signs of what will be happening when he comes in his second coming. What would be the sign of his first coming? 
the sign would be a virgin would conceive. We're used to it in that way. So that's what a sign is. A sign is speaking prophetically of someone or something that is coming. So when we see here that this is a sign, um, and I'm back in verse 17 of, of Genesis 4, and I lost it on my tablet. Let's see if I can get it here. Um, that we, we have to understand what that language is saying to the people, what they're understanding when they hear that this, this covenant sign, this sign of the covenant, his bow, is then his bow has got to be speaking prophetically of someone or something coming. But when I get to spread out the whole rainbow for you, you will admit that's Messiah. When you see that the one who brings healing in his wings, only Messiah could fill that description. No one else can. And it's going to come and it's going to bring that healing when he comes back in his second coming. So putting all that together, um, what I'm going to do because of the way that our time is, is falling is I'm going to go on and uh, bring us a few more verses in chapter 9. And then still, like I say, next week we'll be primed and ready to go back into, um, and maybe, maybe I can stop pretty quick here because we don't want to get too far from the rainbow being the sign and seeing what it is. But let's go just a little bit further. Um, did I do all of 16? I think I did. That when the bow is in the cloud, God's looking on it. He's remembering his everlasting covenant. Don't miss that word everlasting between God and every living creature of all flesh that's on the earth. And God, verse nine, 17, I'm sorry, said to Noah, this is the sign, there it is, of the covenant which I have established between me and all the flesh that is on the earth. Okay, so we've got all of this already that's, that's giving us such a sign speaking to us, speaking prophetically, and we'll see how that plays out when we get into that full study. So, verse 18, now, the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, or Japheth. Ham, or Ham, as you would say, was the father of Canaan. Canaan. Now, Canaan's being singled out because of being the ancestor of the Canaanites. So when Israel enters into the promised land and the first enemy she comes up against are the Canaanites, Canaanites is actually a way to say it from the Hebrew. Their ancestor is this one that's mentioned here. He comes from Ham's line or Ham's line. Okay. Verse 19 tells us these three were the sons of Noah and from these the whole earth was populated. That means that all the physical characteristics of all the different nations we have, of all the tribes, every characteristic that we see in these had to have been present in the genetic constitution of these six people, of Noah's sons and their wives. So when you wonder how did we get, how, what am I going to say safely? Don't anyone please take no offense. If I say it in a way that, that offends you, please know that's not my intent. But when we wonder how did we get the, the black looking people, the Spaniard looking people, the red looking people, the white looking people, you know, all these differences that all came from Noah's three sons. They didn't come because some lived closer to the sun and their skin got dark. They didn't come because they lived more off the land, and so they were more red like the land. I mean, you hear it all, folks. But God put it into the genetic gene pool. And maybe it's easier for me to see and understand because I laugh, but my parents had three children. And if you saw us three children, we're not carbon copies of each other by any means. We have quite a variety among us. We all have very different appearances. My brother and sister are a bit closer than I, but by the time I came along, <laughs> it was very different. And my sister and I even sat under the same teacher in, in junior high or high school, whichever it was. She was seven months through the year of a very small class, two kids with the same last name that's an unusual last name. And she's like, your sisters? <laughs> she was shocked. And I'm thinking, well, where have you been? And her comment was, you don't look anything like each other and your personalities are totally different. And I'd say, yes, we are different. I give you, I babysat three little girls that were stair steps. 
you knew what number two and number one, well, here's number one, two, and three. You know what two and three were going to look like as they got older because those three were just, it was as if mom popped out identical babies at a different time. But in my family, because of the background with my dad who had red hair that went dark and my mom who had dark hair that fell out, came back in blonde, and then went dark later in life. You've got my dad with dark eyes, my mom with green eyes. The whole hodgepodge was there. <laughs> and so my brother came out very reddish and had green eyes. My sister kept the green eyes, although they were blue, more blue when she was little, but green as she aged. She was more strawberry blonde, and along comes Rochelle with dark eyes and auburn hair. Yes, the red highlights are there, but otherwise I've got dark hair. It's all in the same pool. When God put into our genetic play, he put in all of these different characteristics. And we do know that some are more predominant and some are less dominant. And that's what comes out. Although there's all those different, um, you know, things that are surprised too. I remember being told the story of a little girl that had bright red hair. Both her parents did not. She had a grandparent who had bright red hair. And I guess mom and dad got tired of all the questions of who she belonged to that they taught her when she was very, very little and asked, well, where did your red hair come from? She'd look up at them and say, from recessive genes. <laughs> <laughs> I also know a family that was put together by love, by God. They had two sons by natural birth. They adopted a little girl. The two sons looked very much like the father who was dark in appearance. The little girl was very, very fair, and mom was very fair. So one day, mom was out shopping with her three children, her two dark sons by her natural birth and her adopted fair-skinned daughter. And she met an old friend, hadn't seen her in ages. She looks at the three children and she says, well, I know where she came from, but where'd the two boys come from? And my friend broke out laughing and said, you've got it wrong. These two are my genetic children. This one's my adopted one. God put it all in there. Why am I stressing it so long? Because we have a world of hate today. We have a world that says one is superior than another. We have a world that wants to say why it happened and give you evolutionary reasons for it happening. Or worse yet, we have a world that says there's a line that's cursed. God cursed it. It's this line called from Ham, from Hammond's, because of what he's going to do that in a couple lessons we'll be, we'll be getting to. And they put that on the people and say, that's why their skin's that color, because they're cursed by God. If you've noticed, I've left it out. If you don't know what I'm talking about, good. I'm not going to educate you, because it's a lie out of the pit of hell, and it needs to go back to where it came from. God loves variety. And if you are brown, he loves you. If you are white, he loves you. If you were blue, he'd love you too, <laughs> okay? So please realize all of human race came from these three sons. Were these three sons any different? Where do you think that, that Noah said, well, this is my good son and this is my fair son and this is my bad son and so we'll have those lines go out that way? No, I'm sure that he loved them all as any good parent would do equally. And God allowed the genes to bring out the differences. God is amazing. Who else could have thunk up the gene pool to give us 7 billion people on the face of the earth? And even though you think they are, and Dave might take issue with me because he's got twins in his family, but even if you think they're identical, they're not. There are little ways that they are different. And if you don't believe it, ask the twins themselves because they'll tell you. They don't get confused. They know who's who. <laughs> and they know where they're different. They also know where they're alike. But our God is an amazing God. And he did not curse a line of people. And he does not favor a certain people over another. All are equal in his sight. We're all equally sinners. And we're equally saved by grace when we come into grace. So how to get that out of my system, because I've even just heard a few things recently that 
didn't set well with me, obviously. So let me see where I want to stop because I think we're at a point. Can I stop right here? Um, I think I think so, yes, because actually I don't want to go into verse 20. Verse 20 is going to take us away from the rainbow. It's going to take us into what I referred to that Hom is going to do and what the, the meaning of that is. So I think we'll stop with verse 19 right here. We will pick up in Revelation 9, verse 20, but just before we do, I will give you from the start, right when we start, I will give you the rainbow. I will give you a how is a picture of the Lord in his redemptive work. I will give you meaning for the colors. I will give you, um, again, how he gifted it, brought it into play, um, and all that that means. And a few things more. I'm trying to think, what do I want to say to, to entice you to want to come back? Oh, we'll go into the colors. There's meaning in the colors. I'll tell you what might entice you. We're going to see a similarity. We're going to see the similarity with the breastplate of the high priest, with the stones, with the names, with the meaning. Did you know that that, too, is a picture that we can tie in with the rainbow that presents to us our Savior? in his redemptive work, it's a mind blower. So there's a lot of depths. It'll be a very rich study. If you've been through it before, I think it'll still excite you because it's hard to retain it all. But there are, just as there are many colors to the rainbow, there are many levels to get that full picture. So sorry I tantalized you and didn't get it all, but I hope I gave you enough uh, um, in the start today to appreciate and I look forward to our study specifically on the rainbow, and maybe next week I'll wear a rainbow. <laughs> How about the colors of the temple? I mean, they all the yes? You see air, the colors. You see the purple. You see the red. You see the blue. You see the gold. You see. Do we see green? Do we see green? You got me thinking. I'll answer that next week too. Most of them in the temple. So temple, maybe just because it's done on earth and green represents earth, we can pull it out that way. Temple colors, rainbow, but you definitely get a lot of them, definitely. And just like when we study the tabernacle, which the temple is, you know, the permanent the tabernacle was what moved, everything they used, the silver, the Grass, like I brought out today, the gold, everything had meaning also. Everything in this rainbow has meaning. It's no wonder it's what God chose. And he chose to bring it into relation to man when he made that unconditional covenant that we can have shalom with our God. You can wrap yourself up in a rain in the rainbow of his love. That's the pretty cool. Of, of the priest, they have to wear different yes, and they're wearing the FOD, which has these colors and speaks to us on a, another level that I'll bring out next week. Yeah, it's this me. I love that part. When I first saw that, it's like, wow, wow, because you get the meanings and the names and the colors. It, it, it just, he, God's amazing. <laughs> He's multidimensional where I'm just little. Yes. Did, I hear you say, uh, oh, I a long time when we talked about the rainbow, that um, the Jewish leadership would not look on the rainbow. Yes. The rabbis will, would, the rabbis of old, and I believe the ultra uh, orthodox today will not look on the rainbow when it comes because they believe it is God's glory, and they're not worthy of looking at God's glory even. So they'll, it's out of miss, respect, miss, and they miss it. They miss it because we come in through His mercy. We can look and see. So I'm, it. I'm sad for them to miss it, but I do understand their respect in it. And it, God's gifted me with. The rainbow most of you who know me know that and i'll tell you i really feel something between god and i and i'll even tip my hand i'll say it again next week but it, because it just happened and and this is my witness she just stepped out of the room she's got to come back last saturday with no rain i saw a double rainbow i don't know if she got to see double but i saw a double rainbow and i did Flippers. <laughs> I was in my car, I was all alone, and I'm glad for all of you I was alone. <laughs> but I was coming back from somewhere. I was vacillating whether I wanted to make this stop. I really didn't want to. I wanted to just come home. I knew I needed to. In the last minute, I went ahead and went on the freeway transition that turned me in this direction. And right
right through that, right after that, I transitioned onto um, where I was headed up, and that put me facing north and the east. But, you know, it was eastern sky, but I was facing north. And right when I came around the bend, bend I'm sorry, it was like God said, boom, here, Rochelle. And here is this gorgeous, and it was immediately a double, immediately, and it was gorgeous. I literally exploded. I mean, I had my... Um, I was listening to a pastor on the radio, and all of a sudden, you know, I went, oh, wow, God, awesome. And then I started praising him. And I was just, you know, I couldn't get off fast enough and parked to take a picture that showed well. I have a picture of a faint rainbow, but it was a brilliant double. The first one, very bright. The double was a little faint. And I felt like if I would have missed it, if I didn't take that turn, God encouraged me to take that turn. This is where I want you. And then, boom, here it is, Rochelle. And I just, I went crazy. And no rain. That was the mind blower. The sun was even starting to set. It was 6.30 to 7 at night. I don't know. I don't know. It had to been raining somewhere because I'd even seen what I thought was sun rays coming through and it could have been rain. Mine was a double. Was yours a double, Ann? It was so clear. So clear, yeah. Wow. It was it was bright. It was beautiful. It was in my face. It was up front and personal. And I say, do it again, God. Hit me again. <laughs> I was headed north toward... Um, I had, I had just transitioned onto the 330 coming off of the 210. So I was headed toward the Highland area in, in that area. I was over there. And like I said, by the time I could get off and park, it was already too late to. Last, last year, uh, last year, even before last, I was going towards Walmart right there, exiting off the freeway. And there was a big rainbow. And you can see where the rainbow, the freeway underneath it, right past the rainbow, you see where it hit the ground. Oh, wow. Just it wow. I right. can tell you rainbow story after rainbow story. I can <laughs> tell you one where I saw it come down to the ground like that. And that was a miracle story, too. That's a 20-minute story because yeah. that, that has to do with, with, as my mom used to love to say it, and I'll just give you the title, and someday you can hear it if you want. My daughter drives a stolen car. <laughs> 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 drives a stolen car that's what my mom used to like to say and the lord gave me a rainbow in that story that i share and it, it was my car stolen in return but uh, it's a it's a wow story too we got to close in prayer i'm way past i've lost a few of my audience i had to go without getting us to close let me close us and then we'll come back on that high note, come back ready to start with the rainbow, ready to be blessed over all this represents to us because it's an amazing gift from God. Amazing. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the gift of yourself. Thank you that you are the one who came and took our punishment to give us that abundant life. Thank you that we will see that rainbow around your head and around your throne forever thank you for the promises that it represents to us unconditional because it is you who does it that you're entering in a covenant with your people and that you intended for your people to have shalom with you lord we praise you for all of this we praise and we thank you that in a world that is growing darker and sicker and more full of sin and ugliness and it makes us anxious to come home, Lord. We thank you that we have that promise that's as bright as a rainbow, as brilliant, and that it is just a sneak peek of your Shekhina glory. Oh, Lord, you are awesome. You are ineff ineffable. You are amazing. And you are our God. We get to call you Abba, Father, and you call us your people. Hallelujah. We praise you. We thank you forever and ever in the precious name of our rainbow giving god yeshua his son amen amen